entering our, our final stretch, as it were, have some uh, festooned penguins for you today. Uh, this variety is the rockhopper penguin. Uh, I think these were on, a, on one of the Falkland Islands south of, of Argentina. Uh, and as, as the name implies, they live on rocks. They also have a, uh, uh, this makes me think of the, the meme with Pooh uh, Bear looking very uh, smug in a tuxedo. This, this penguin looks that way to me. Um, interesting, the, the red color of the eye is sort of a, a different looking bird. And they, they share islands sometimes with the, the black albatross. Um, if you're not familiar with, with albatross, they can kind of lock their wings and, and remain aloft for days, weeks, or even months over the ocean, uh, uh, just landing occasionally to, to breed. Very, um, uh, very kind of mind-boggling species of bird. Another thing is these albatross can live about 70 years. Uh, which means they live at least twice as long as the penguins who are, are sharing this island with them. Our rock hopper penguins make nests out of like mud and grass and things and have the, the dirty feet to, to show for it. Uh, but they are not the, the most elaborately, uh, I guess, like head uh, decorated penguins. That probably goes to the macaroni penguin, um, which has quite the little, little crown going on. All right, uh, there were uh, some questions about the first problem on the quiz, the, the unique list um, came up in, in office hours, so I just wanted to clarify a few points. Uh, the unique list class should have two methods, and Well, two methods that you are adding. There is a, a double underscore wrapper method that's part of the, the, the starter code. The two methods that you are adding a constructor that takes in an initial list, and the outcome of this constructor, there should be, so like when, when and it is done. The instance variable self dot my list my list should be a list of elements from this initial list without any duplicates. So as part of this in a constructor, you'll need to create a, a new list. You'll need to put into it elements from the initial list that aren't duplicates. And by the end, the instance variable self.myList should be that new list of unique elements. So this provides us a way to create a unique list object from a normal Python list that then will have only unique stuff in it. We also want our unique list we want to be able to add new elements to it after we create it, which is why we also have an append method, which will append the new element to our list, to my list, as long as it wouldn't be a duplicate. So we're thinking of our Unique list has a normal Python list inside of it that it's keeping track of it as an instance variable. And the purpose of this class is that if we just had a normal Python list and we append to it, it's always going to append the thing whether that number is already in the list or not. So we're creating this new class that has this list inside of it. And the methods of that class are what is 
enforcing or providing this property that our inner list has only unique things. Any questions about unique list, how that works? All right, any other questions about uh, the lab, object stuff, dictionaries? Cool. Uh, for the mouse in the lab, um, it says you don't have any control over the mouse's color. In the example, the mouse is like a bunch of random colors. I didn't really see where that was coming from in the, uh, the handout. Uh, so let's look at that. Enough of you, Penguin. Your time is done. Um, go to our lab handout. Go to our mouse. So the color should be the color passed to the constructor. Uh, so um, whenever a um, mouse object is created, it's going to be given a color, and that's the color the mouse should be. Uh, so if we look at code from the lab, say our uh, critter.model or critter.main, um, probably the model add So there's like a lot of code in this critter model to like set up all the critters appropriately. Um, and there's this create parameters that says, if I'm creating a mouse, I need to create a random color. If I'm creating an elephant, I need to create a random number for the number of steps. Otherwise, no other critter's constructor takes parameters. So it's just built into this critter world that if we're making a mouse, we need to give it a random color. Making an elephant, get a, give it a random number of steps. Okay. And another question is, if we say color in the constructor, how does Python know that we're talking about the instance variable color versus the uh, what you set up with um, color.py, color.red, and all that. Um, so like, uh, so we know something is an instance variable when we have uh, self dot in front of it. And so if we have self dot color, this is the instance variable color as opposed to any other uh, color that, that might exist. Uh, and then if we say have equals color, Python has a sort of order of the places it will look for something called color. And the first place it looks is, is there a variable defined in this function called color? And when it comes to the mouse constructor, there is. One of the parameters to this function is called color, and so that's what would be used here. Other questions? All right. So those of you who were here uh, last time or watched the, the recording know that uh, uh, I, I harbor national political ambitions and that I need to keep track of all the, the names and emails um, for my, my campaign volunteers, and we've gotten up to the point of saying, well, I could have a list of lists, and each of my inner lists has like a name and an email as the elements, but we talked about, well, how would we look up to see if a particular volunteer is in the database, or how would we get the email associated with a particular volunteer, and we just had to search through every single thing in our database in our, uh, in our list of lists to check if any of them matched what we were looking for. And if I have millions upon millions of, of campaign volunteers, this is going to be a, a pretty slow, inefficient database. And so I said at the end of last time, that we could use a dictionary 
which is a kind of data structure where a data structure is a way of organizing data on uh, a computer system. And we've seen other examples uh, like a list, a string. These are both data structures, ways of organizing uh, particular data. And our dictionary in particular was a set of key value pairs where each thing in our dictionary, like a dictionary of, of words, the key would be the word, the value would be the associated definition. And if we have like a physical uh, dictionary, we find an entry according to the key, to the word, because they're in an order such that we can easily find one, and that lets us look up the value, the, the definition of that word. So, in Python, our dictionary can be uh, uh, flexible in that uh, there are all sorts of things we can use as a key and associate different values with them. So, uh, in this case, I could create my database like this, and though they might not look like it, these are curly braces, just two curly braces, and this is <coughs> creating an empty dictionary that I'm putting in this variable database. And then I can say <coughs> my volunteer Bilbo has an email of bb at bagend.co.uk. And this line here says create the key. Bilbo and associate the value bb at bagend.co.uk. And so this uses square brackets like we've seen for indexing into to lists or, or tuples or strings. But in this case, what's inside our square brackets is our key. And what we're setting that entry in our dictionary, the entry under the key Bilbo equal to is our value. And in this case, they're both strings, but they don't have to be. And then, so this is putting a volunteer into my database. And what was something else that we wanted? What was one of the other operations that uh, we needed to do with this this database. Cool. Yeah, we might want to update an email, and we actually use exactly this same syntax to create a new key value pair as we do to change an existing one. So if we said If uh, uh, Bilbo's email changed uh, to um, Bilbo is the best at gmail.com, this would Replace the value for the key Bilbo. So there is no distinction in the syntax for 
creating a new key value pair in our database in our dictionary versus changing one that's already there. We have our variable that has the dictionary, square brackets, our key equals the value that we want associated with that key. <coughs> What's another operation we, we need to do with our volunteer database? Maya? Yes, we might want to remove volunteers. Uh, that uses a special uh, term del, short for delete. And we have delete and then the expression indexing that key. This will remove Bilbo and the associated value from our database. What's another operation? Eric? Wouldn't the name of the volunteer get out their email? Yeah, maybe we want to print Bilbo's email. And if we have the dictionary indexed by the key, that's going to return the associated value. So just like when we have seen uh, like list, our list bracket zero, when it's part of some expression, that's going to return the element at index zero. But a special case when it's on the left-hand side of an equals, that means we're assigning something to that slot, that index zero in the list. Our dictionary works the same way. We just print database by Bilbo. This is going to return our associated value. And so we'd print out Bilbo is the best at gmail.com. Questions on this so far? So one other thing that we might want to do is to check, is a certain volunteer in our database? And we can do that using the in operator like we have used to check if something is in a list. So if Bilbo in database, this would be Bilbo in database would be true if the key Bilbo has previously been put into our database and false otherwise. So this lets us uh, check if, if something is there. One more bit of dictionary syntax is how would we create a dictionary that doesn't start empty. As I've shown you that if we have just curly braces with nothing between them, that's going to create an empty dictionary. But to create something that's not empty, inside curly braces, we put key value pairs separated by, uh, with a colon between the key and the value. So we could say, all right, the key A is associated with the value 5. And then if we wanted to put a second key value pair, I'd put a comma. The key B is associated with the value 7. And so X would be a dictionary that has two keys, the string A and the string B. And the key A is associated with the integer 5, the key B associated with the integer 7. This is our way of, of creating a dictionary that starts with some uh, uh, key and value pairs already in there. What are your questions about this? All right, let's do a bit of practice. <coughs> with our cards. 
We've seen that one before. Here's uh, here's a new one, uh, continuing with my uh, my theme. Uh, so I create a dictionary, rings of power, and then do some things uh, with it. Something that's that's showing up here that I uh, forgot to mention was that we can also, just like we have, uh, can use a for loop to go through all the uh, uh, elements in a list. We can use a for loop to go through all the keys. So in the example on the board, for... <coughs> If I did if I did the loop for key in X and printed out key, this would print out A and B. <coughs> this for loop will go through each of the keys in our in our dictionary. And of course, if we wanted to go through the values, we can use the key to get the value uh, uh, by using it in, in square brackets. So if we wanted to print out the value. You could print x brackets key. All right, that in mind, take a look at this code here uh, and think about what it is going to print. All right, the prints will be on two, <coughs> two different lines. Um, and uh, I've separated the two different lines with spaces uh, on on the possible answers here because it doesn't let me have multi-line line answers. But imagine the output has multiple lines. All right, please discuss with your neighbor how you're thinking about uh, what the, the different lines in this code will do. All right, it indeed will be C. Uh, can, Someone share with us why we get false printed out. Ezra. Because if we check if there is the key hobbits in the dictionary and there is not, then false. Exactly. Uh, and how about why do we print out ring, total rings 20? Gabby. Um, so in line 7, we add a dollar line to the dictionary. Um, and then our loop is going through and basically using counter to add all the values for each of the keys. Um, so now that we have four keys, we actually put seven plus nine plus one. Exactly right. That we are. This loop is is summing up all the values, and if we remember to include the one that was added here, that will that will total up to twenty. Any questions on this example? One other thing to mention about dictionaries, we can use our len function with a dictionary, and that's going to return the number of keys in that dictionary. So len will, will give us the, the uh, number, number of entries, number of keys in, in the dictionary. Eric. Can you put in a key without a value? Uh, so if we, so, Let's take this example dictionary X here. If I say print X of foo, there's no such key as foo. This is going to give, uh, give us a key error. The program will, will stop with, with an error on this line if we try and get the value for a key that doesn't exist. Other questions? Mine. Is it possible to have multiple values assigned to one key? Is it possible to have multiple values assigned to one key? It is not. Each key is unique. Um, and when uh, I get, get into what is going on underneath the surface to make the dictionary work, uh, I think it will become clear why we can't have uh, uh, multiple entries for the same key. We need multiple values associated with a key. We just might make the value a list of the things associated with that key. Other questions? All right, now 
that we are armed with data structure knowledge. Come on. Let's try it on here. I think it is not that one. <clears throat> So one thing that we uh, uh, might do when uh, uh, when programming something is have to decide what data structure should we use. I want to represent some data, and I'll need to decide should this be a list, a dictionary, a string, a tuple, maybe other things. And so this decision of like what to use to represent data is a crucial one. And so now that we know about a few different data structures, I thought it would be worth practicing this choice of what we should use. So we have a, we're going to go through a few different scenarios. The first one is uh, if we have an online poll, and I want to keep track of the number of votes for different choices. Uh, what should I use to do that? All right, please make your case uh, to, to your neighbor why it should be the data structure you chose. We're close to consensus on a, a dictionary, which uh, would, be, would be my thought as, as well. Can someone uh, share your, your reasoning why a dictionary might make sense here? Gabby? Um, we're wanting to pair some sort of values. <coughs> Specify what index each represents each number Yeah, that's that's a great point. That the sort of this scenario suggests this pairing of two values or dictionary set of key value pairs. So whenever we want to, to represent this sort of uh, uh, pairing, this would be very, um, very convenient. Uh, if you were to go and redo lab three now, instead of a list of vote party tuples, a dictionary might be far more convenient. Um, and, but the point, uh, one thing to take away from that is that a dictionary is not the only way to represent this data. We could use a combination of lists, uh, nested lists or lists and tuples to also sort of represent two things paired together. Uh, but a dictionary has, has some nice advantages. Questions or, or comments on this? All right, next scenario. A check-in system representing people waiting in line. What might you use for that? All right, again, make your case to a neighbor of which data structure you chose. I would agree with the majority that uh, a list might be a good, good fit. Uh, someone share some reasons why uh, uh, a, a waiting line might, might go well with a list. The uh, indexing in a list like, takes care of the position. Yeah, our list has it's the elements in a particular position, in a particular order, just like a line should, as long as you know people aren't, aren't cutting and, and whatnot. Um, we also, people leave the line, people come into the line, so a structure that allows us to remove things and add things is helpful in this sort of situation. Questions or comments? Scenario three, online store representing a catalog of items. <coughs> Oops. All right, make your case. 
All right. Again, we have consensus, uh, and I would be a member of that consensus. Uh, someone uh, share your your reasoning for why a dictionary would be a good choice. I said. Um, it's because uh, you need to also associate. You're not just thinking about the items. You also have to think about associating the value of prices along with them. Yeah, exactly. The, again, we have a situation where we have. Uh, uh, one piece of data like an item and then an associated piece of data like the price and uh, We might want to be able to uh, Look up what is the given an item look up what the price is and a, and a dictionary works very nicely for that questions or comments How about a photo editing program that needs to represent an error message to display to the user? All right, pretty pretty one-sided. Uh, I think we will we'll probably want to use a string for this. Someone share what you were <coughs> what you were thinking when you chose string. Marcus. I mean, I think it's just a message, so you don't really need a list like index. Exactly. It's text that we want to show on this on the screen. A string is how we represent text in our in our in our programs. So, perfect fit. All right. This is uh, in in the in the labs in this class. Uh, this uh, sort of decision is is typically made for you. Um, the lab has a particular structure. There's something that we're, we're practicing, so often not having to decide uh, what data structure to use. But labs are not the only thing that we're doing in this class, uh, which brings me to my next topic. That is the final project uh, that will uh, be working on for the last couple weeks of, of the term. I want to talk about it now. <laughs> So this is, the, the overview is this will be a project of your own design. And you will be able to work alone or with a partner of your choice. And you and potentially your partner will propose a particular project. Uh, and then uh, I will either say, sounds great, or you might think about changing it in this way, or that wouldn't make a good project Here's maybe a different direction to consider. So what are your options for kind of uh, getting creative uh, and, uh, and exploring? So option number one is a simulation. So uh, this would be uh, examples uh, that we've done, like the prisoner's dilemma uh, lab. That was a simulation, simulating some uh, some phenomena. Uh, you could do some sort of physics simulation, uh, orbiting orbiting planets, or or uh, some sort of Newtonian uh, physics. Other folks have uh, simulated uh, growing plants uh, or other kind of biological stuff. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be like some scientifically accurate simulation, but the requirements are uh, there needs to be more than one type of thing involved in the simulation. There needs to be interactions between elements of the simulation. So you can't have a bunch of objects just sort of chilling, doing their own thing. That's not, uh, not that interesting of a simulation. And there has to be some kind of user interaction. So whether that's the user creates elements in the simulation or controls the speed of the simulation or uh, can view different parts of the simulation, some sort of user interaction. The other kind of project you can attempt would be a computer game. This could be, I should say, <laughs> for both the simulation and the game, 
It doesn't, it, it can be graphical using PGL or uh, I think there'll be time for me to, to demo a, a 3D uh, visualization uh, library uh, in Python, uh, but it can also be text-based. So you can have a, a, a simulation of uh, like something folks have done in the past, um, which has taken on a, a, a bit of a different meaning now is a disease simulation. Um, and that would be kind of printing out aspects of, of the simulation as it, as it went along. Um, for, for a game, uh, there's lots of different examples, uh, word games like Boggle or Scrabble, um, uh, kind of geometric games, uh, an example should be Dots and Boxes, uh, Battleship, uh, uh, lots of folks have done Connect Four, uh, is pretty popular. Um, there's also a game called Bagels, a kind of uh, a number guessing game that's described as part of the, the project, uh, the, this write-up. Um, there are some games that are too simple for the final project. Hangman, Tic-Tac-Toe, Blackjack. There's just like not enough uh, uh, rules and kind of interactions in those kind of games to, to make a good final project. And definitely there can be games that are far too complicated um, uh, to, uh, for the final project. You're also welcome to use one of our labs as a starting point. So uh, people in the past have taken Breakout and then added kind of interesting features to that game as a final project. The main kind of requirement, other than the user gets to play a game of some kind, is that there is some level of computer intelligence. That means that the computer should play against you in some, like, not completely random way. The computer doesn't have to be good at the game, but it should be doing something uh, at least a little intelligent. So in the Connect 4 example, uh, um, if you're not familiar, uh, it's sort of like tic-tac-toe where you're trying to make a row uh, uh, of things. Uh, so a computer player that just picked a move randomly would not meet this kind of minimum intelligence, uh, but a computer player that uh, picked say, a random spot to start trying to make Connect 4 and that also like looked across the board to see if on a move, if it could win on that move, it would do it rather than like doing something else. That would kind of meet the, the bar of, of an intelligent computer player. So the kind of two uh, things you need to turn in, the two deliverables for the project is a project proposal. Uh, so that's coming up and uh, uh, next next week, and so that is both uh, you you and your partner's name will be on the proposal. So that is how you will tell me if you're working with a partner and who that is. Um, and uh, uh, you will also describe kind of what the project is, and you will describe a plan for actually implementing that proposal. And I'll, I'll say more about that in a minute. Uh, and then you must submit um, the kind of final code and any associated files and documentation by the uh, 9 p.m. last day of finals, which is the 24th. All right, any, any questions on any part of, of the final project? Marco? No, no. no. Okay. Uh, Say a little bit more about oh, that's that's not that exciting. Um, allow me to open the sample proposal. Uh, so this is an example of a proposal for a game called Roll a Rainbow, where you're rolling. Uh, uh, dice that have different colors instead of numbers on the faces. This would be a text-based game. And this uh, proposal kind of, uh, describes the rules of the game. Uh, you have six dice. Here's what's on the dice. Here's what people do when they take a turn in the game. Here are the, the rules for, for how it's scored. 
And then the second part of the proposal is like here are the different pieces of code that will go in to this project. So they'll uh, be a die, there'll be a class to keep track of everything about a player, like what their score is. Um, and then there's a function that will uh, play the game. And inside a loop, this function will kind of do the turns uh, for, for the different players. And then the last part of the plan um, is how you are, how you are going to test uh, or kind of in what order you're going to do to work on the different components um, of the uh, of the game. And the purpose of this kind of proposal is that you want to propose something uh, that you can reasonably accomplish in the time that you will have to do it and kind of taking the the time to think through okay what are the different pieces of this project and kind of what order do i need to implement them in uh, is a good way to kind of propose a project that is going to be do doable and that you kind of can wrap your head around um, an important part of how the final project is graded is that a program that runs without crashing, even if it's very simple, will get a better grade than a very complicated program that has a bunch of bugs. And so this means that you should have some sort of simple, kind of minimal version of your project that you get working first, and then you try and make it more complicated. Very common mistake is to try and make the fanciest, most complicated version of the project immediately without getting anything simpler working. And then you just never manage to get through the debugging the super complicated version before it's due. So getting some simple version working <coughs> first, great way to, to approach the project. Questions on this? No. Yeah. Uh, so you can have like a single player game, but as long as like the computer does something intelligent, that's right, yes. Okay. The game does not have to have multiple players. It can just be you against against the computer. Or, I, I guess, or the computer is involved in some, some way. Uh, yeah, so a single-player game where the only role of the computer is to, say, shuffle a deck of cards, that would not be a kind of computer intelligence. Other questions? All right, so should you want to uh, uh, do something in uh, three dimensions for your, your final project, uh, you could use a uh, Python uh, library called vPython, short for Visual Python. And Visual Python just uh, like PGL lets us create a circle, Visual Python lets us create a, a sphere. So if I run this little program here, <coughs> it's going to open a web browser page because this is how it displays the 3D. It displays it in, in a web browser. So it opens up this Chrome and tab, and we have this uh, uh, wonderful sphere in, in the void. I can uh, right click and drag to rotate the camera. I can scroll in and out. And so I, I have this, this sphere in, in 3D. But we want to do more than just, just a blank sphere. Uh, I can control how big the sphere is by setting its radius equals 0.5. This is something that, that you'll see throughout this example, uh, which is the parameters to a function. We typically have provided them just in a certain order, but you can also provide them by name in Python. So regardless of whether the radius parameter is the first or the seventh, if I say radius equals, it will provide that input as the radius. 
So I have this sphere. I'm going to put it in a variable called ball. And I'll set the velocity to vPython has a vector that's like a, a 3D, uh, three dimensional x, y, and z uh, uh, vector. And we'll do this. So now that I have my ball and its velocity, seems awfully stationary, which is a bit, bit disappointing. So just like with PGL, just keeping track of a velocity, we actually need to tell the object to move rather than just having a, a number that's a velocity. So I'm going to do it inside a while loop and an infinite loop because I want this uh, uh, simulation to, to go on forever. And I will say the position of the ball is its current position plus its velocity. Well, something happened. Uh, the, the ball went somewhere. Um, so one thing about vPython is that uh, it automatically zooms out the camera to keep all the objects visible on screen. So maybe it just like zoomed way out. Uh, so I can turn that off. vPython.scene.autoscale is false. And let's see if that fixed it. <coughs> nope, still, still the void. So another thing is this while loop is happening as fast as my computer is able to make it happen. And that might be many, many times per second, and it will cause things to move really fast, because it's moving it every time I go around the while loop. Uh, so vPython actually has a way to say, only let this while loop go around 50 times per second. And then I will just pick some amount of time, say uh, 1 200th of a second, and say that's how much time I want to simulate to have passed every time I go around the while loop. So this is just like slowing down the simulation in the hope that it will allow me to see what's what's happening. And there we go. It the the ball just just you know heads off into the void, but at least at least we can see it now. So that's good. So let's add some some other other things into our scene here let's add a uh, wall that's going to be to the right of the ball and to to make the wall i will use a box and i will need to give it a position so i'll make it six to the right along the x-axis and i will need to give it a size, which is also in three dimensions. So I'll have this be 0.2, very narrow in the x direction, and 12 in the others. And I'll also give it a color. vPython.color.red. So that's my right wall. I'll make a left one. Make that one green, make it negative six, call it wall left. Let's see what this looks like. Oh, there's, there's been some color dot green. All right. Let's, uh, let's try it with the right color name. Okay, we have our walls, but the ball just, you know, uh, uh, oozes right through through the wall. Uh, so, suggestion on on an uh, approach to get our our ball to actually you know bounce. Cool. 
if wall dot pause equals wall r dot pause um, wall dot velocity times negative wall. Yeah, well, the same trick we've used uh, in uh, breakout, for example. Something hits a boundary, we just check when it hits it and reverse its its velocity. So if the ball's position dot x is greater than or equal to the right wall's uh, position dot x, <coughs> the ball's velocity dot x We'll multiply that by negative 1. And we'll do a similar thing with the left wall. Ah, that's why it's looking weird. Uh, if it's less than or equal to uh, the left wall's x, then we'll have it bounce there. Now let's see if we have... So it is bouncing. It does go halfway into the wall before its x-coordinate, the center of the sphere, uh, knows to bounce. Uh, so uh, that, but that's decent. Uh, maybe we'll give our uh, uh, velocity a y component uh, so we can see the ball do something more interesting than just endlessly bounce. I mean, so we're not checking is the x position, you know, within the wall, so it will bounce between these eternally. Um, but one other sort of fun, fun thing we can do in VPython is uh, actually have an object, uh, a 3D object, like show us the direction of something. So I'm going to create a, uh, uh, a velocity arrow, something that's just going to show us uh, where the, the ball's velocity is. So I'm going to make that an arrow. Its position is the ball's position. Its axis is the ball's velocity. So that just means the arrow is going to point in the same direction as the ball's velocity. Uh, and then I'll make it uh, yellow in, in color. Oops. Okay. Um, and so we've we've made this arrow. Um, it's a very large arrow, and it's also not moving uh, at all. Uh, so that's that's uh, we could be could be better. So. I just need to, at the same time I'm updating the position of the ball, I need to say, okay, my arrow's position is the ball's position and should follow the ball around. <laughs> it is following the ball around, but it's not showing us the velocity because I also want the axis to be whatever the ball's velocity is. Ah, there we go. We have we have a, a giant indicator of the velocity of the ball. Uh, so this is uh, a little taste of what VPython can do. Uh, if I search for VPython uh, documentation, that will uh, take me to the, the website with documentation. Um, the website is a bit of a mess because there is multiple versions of vPython. Um, for a while, vPython did not work with Python 3, and then they fixed it with this version that goes in the browser, but this old version is still around. Um, so uh, we actually need to go to vPython.org to get to the documentation for vPython 7, which is the version that that works uh, with with modern Python, uh, and there's links to to, to videos, um, and you can see that there's arrows, boxes, cones, uh, 
pyramids and create different lights, um, all sorts of all sorts of different stuff. Uh, all right. Any any questions about uh, about our our V Python example here? All right. Uh, yeah, Gabby. Uh, this is my question about Python, but could you sort of explain why you think that mm -hmm. is there any like? Uh, yes, I I should have of uh, publicized this more. Um, I will put a, a link to this in the final project description. Uh, but there is VPython documentation. It was linked uh, from Lab Two in this one spot, so I apologize for that. But yes, it, there is kind of this documentation of all the different things that, that PGL has and, and how they work. Thank you. Other questions? All right, that'll do it for today. Uh, quiz due tomorrow night. I have office hours tomorrow night, keep working on the lab, uh, and I will see you Wednesday.